On the 8th of the Jewish month of Ab, in late July 70 AD, Titus, the son of the Roman Emperor Vespasian, who was in command of the four-month siege of Jerusalem, ordered his entire army to prepare to storm the temple at dawn. A total of 60,000 Roman legionaries and local auxiliaries were eager to deliver the final blow to the defiant but broken city. Within the walls, half a million starving Jews survived in diabolical conditions. Some were fanatical religious zealots, some were freebooting bandits, but most were innocent families with no escape from this magnificent death trap. This final desperate struggle would decide not only the fate of the city and her inhabitants, but also the future of Judaism and the small Jewish cult of Christianity, and even, looking forward across six centuries, the shape of Islam. The Romans had built ramps up against the walls of the temple, but their assaults had failed. Titus told his generals that his efforts to preserve this foreign temple were costing him too many soldiers, and he ordered the temple gates set alight. The silver of the gates melted and spread the fire to the wooden doorways, windows and fittings within, thence to wood piled in the passageways of the temple itself. Titus ordered the fire to be quenched. The Romans, he declared, should not avenge themselves on inanimate objects instead of men. Then he retired for the night into his headquarters in the half-ruined Tower of Antonia overlooking the resplendent temple complex. Around the city walls there were gruesome scenes that must have resembled hell on earth. In the preceding months Titus had ordered all prisoners or defectors to be crucified. Five hundred Jews were crucified each day. The Mount of Olives and the craggy hills around the city were so crowded with crucifixes that there was scarcely room for any more, nor trees to make them. Thousands of bodies putrefied in the sun, and the stench was unbearable. Dogs and jackals feasted in packs. Many Jerusalemites, as they escaped, swallowed their coins to conceal their treasure. They emerged, swelled like men with dropsy, but if they ate, they burst asunder. As their bellies exploded, the soldiers discovered their reeking intestinal treasure troves, so they started eviscerating all prisoners while they were still alive. Titus tried to ban these anatomical plunderings, but the cruelties inflicted by the Romans and the rebels within the walls compare with some of the worst atrocities of the twentieth century. The war had begun when the ineptitude and greed of the Roman governors had driven even the Judean aristocracy, Rome's own Jewish allies, to make common cause with a popular revolt. The rebels had exploited the collapse of the regime following the suicide of the crazed emperor Nero to expel the Romans and re-establish an independent Jewish state based around the temple. But the Jewish revolution immediately started to consume itself in bloody purges and gang warfare. By the time Vespasian emerged as emperor and dispatched Titus to take Jerusalem, the city was divided between three warlords at war with each other. Their fighters, provincial cutthroats, killed anyone in their path. In their ingenious depravity, they invented unlawful pleasures. Jerusalem, given over to intolerable uncleanness, became a brothel and torture chamber, and yet remained a shrine. Pilgrims had arrived for Passover just before Titus closed in on the city, trapping them and many refugees from the war, so there were hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem. Only as Titus encircled the walls did the rebel chieftains halt their infighting to face the Romans together. The city that Titus saw was, in Pliny's words, by far the most celebrated city of the East, a vibrant metropolis built around one of the greatest temples of the ancient world, an exquisite work of art on an immense scale. Jerusalem had already existed for thousands of years, but this many-walled and towered city, astride two mountains amid the barren crags of Judea, had never been as populous or as awesome as it was in the first century A.D.
Indeed, Jerusalem would not be so great again until the twentieth century. This Jerusalem was the achievement of Herod the Great, the brilliant, psychotic Judean king whose palaces and fortresses were built on so monumental a scale and were so luxurious in their decoration that the Jewish historian Josephus says that they exceed all my ability to describe them. The temple itself overshadowed all else in its numinous glory. At the first rising of the sun, its gleaming courts and gilded gates reflected back a very fiery splendour and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away. When strangers, such as Titus and his legionaries, saw it for the first time, it appeared like a mountain covered with snow. Jews knew that at the centre of this city within a city, atop Mount Moriah, was a tiny room that was the focus of Jewish sanctity, the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God himself. Herod's temple was a shrine, but it was also a near impregnable fortress within the walled city. The Jews, aided by Jerusalem's precipitous heights, her fortifications and the labyrinthine temple itself, had confronted Titus with overweening confidence. After all, they had defied Rome for almost five years. However, Titus set about reducing Jerusalem with systematic efficiency and overwhelming force. The Jews fought for every inch with almost suicidal abandon. Titus, commanding the full arsenal of siege engines, catapults, and the ingenuity of Roman engineering, overcame the first wall within fifteen days. He led a thousand legionaries into the maze of Jerusalem's markets and stormed the second wall. But the Jews sorted out and retook the wall, which had to be stormed all over again. Finally, Titus decided to encircle and seal the entire city by building a wall of circumvallation. Next, the Romans stormed and razed the hulking Antonia fortress that commanded the temple itself, leaving one tower where Titus had set up his command post. By midsummer, as the blistered and jagged hills sprouted forests of fly-blown crucified cadavers, the city within was tormented by a sense of impending doom, intransigent fanaticism, whimsical sadism, and searing hunger. Yet the rebels were still fighting. Although Titus was proving to be a gifted commander and a popular son of the new emperor, Vespasian's unproven dynasty depended on victory over the Jewish rebels. Titus's entourage was filled with Jewish renegades, including three Jerusalemites. The historian Josephus, a rebel Jewish commander who had defected to the Romans and became Titus's advisor. The king Herod Agrippa II, a very Roman Jew, brought up at the court of the Emperor Claudius, and the king's sister Berenice, who had recently become Titus's mistress. In her best years and at the height of her beauty, noted Josephus. At the start of the rebellion, she and her brother, who lived together, incestuously claimed their enemies, had attempted to face down the rebels with a last appeal to reason. Now these three Jews helplessly watched the death agony of a famous city, Berenice from the bed of its destroyer. Prisoners and defectors brought news from within the city that especially upset Josephus, whose own parents were trapped inside. Even the fighters started to run out of food, so they too probed and dissected the quick and the dead, for gold, for crumbs, for mere seeds, stumbling and staggering like mad dogs. They ate cow dung, leather, girdles, shoes and old hay. A rich woman named Mary became so demented that she killed her own son and roasted him. The rebels smelt the delicious aroma and burst into the house, but even those crazed hatchetmen, on seeing the child's half-eaten body, went out trembling. Jerusalem was, Josephus observed, like a wild beast gone mad, which, for want of food, fell now upon eating its own flesh. That night of the eighth of Ab, when Titus had retired to rest, his legionaries tried to douse the fire as he had ordered but the rebels attacked the firefighters. The Romans fought back, 
and pushed the Jews into the temple itself. One legionary, seized with a divine fury, grabbed some burning materials and lit the curtains and frame of a golden window linked to the rooms around the actual temple. By morning, the fire had spread to the very heart of holiness. The Jews, seeing the flames licking the Holy of Holies and threatening to destroy it, made a great clamour and ran to prevent it. But it was too late. They barricaded themselves in the inner court, then watched in a ghast silence. Just a few yards away, among the ruins of the Antonia fortress, Titus was awakened. He jumped up and again ordered the fire extinguished. He was followed by thousands of Roman soldiers who pretended not to hear him, and even shouted ahead to their comrades to toss in more firebrands. Many legionaries were crushed or burned to death in the stampede of their bloodlust and hunger for gold, plundering so much that the price would soon drop across the east. Titus, unable to stop the fire, and surely relieved at the prospect of final victory, proceeded through the burning temple until he came to the Holy of Holies. Even the high priest was only allowed to enter there once a year, but Titus looked inside. He saw it and its contents, which he found to be far superior, wrote Josephus. Indeed, not inferior to what we ourselves boasted of it. Now he ordered his centurions to beat any soldiers spreading the fire, but their passions were too strong. As the fire rose around the Holy of Holies, Titus was pulled to safety by his aides. Thousands of civilians and rebels mustered on the steps of the altar, waiting to fight to the last, or just die hopelessly. All had their throats cut by the exhilarated Romans, until... Around the altar lay dead bodies heaped one upon another, with the blood running down the steps. Ten thousand Jews died in the burning temple. The cracking of vast stones and wooden beams made a sound like thunder. Josephus watched the death of the temple. The roar of the flames streaming far and wide mingled with the groans of the falling victims, and owing to the height of the hill and the mass of the burning pile, one would have thought the whole city was ablaze. And then the din, nothing more deafening or appalling could be conceived than that. There were the war cries of the Roman legions sweeping onward, the howls of the rebels encircled by fire and swords, the rush of the people, who, cut off above, fled panic-stricken, only to fall into the arms of the foe, and their shrieks as they met their fate. You would have thought the Temple Hill was boiling over from its base, being everywhere one mass of flame. Mount Moriah, where King David had placed the Ark of the Covenant, and where his son Solomon had built the first temple, was seething hot full of fire on every part of it, while inside dead bodies covered the floors. Now the rampaging Romans, seeing that the inner temple was destroyed, grabbed the gold and furniture, carrying out their swag before they set fire to the rest of the complex. As the next day dawned, the surviving rebels broke out through the Roman lines into the labyrinthine outer courtyards, some escaping into the city. The Romans counterattacked with cavalry, clearing the insurgents and then burning the temple's treasury chambers, filled with riches from across the Jewish world, from Alexandria to Babylon. They found six thousand women and children huddled there. The legionaries simply set the passageways alight, burning all these people alive. Priests were still hiding around the Holy of Holies. Two plunged into the flames, and one succeeded in bringing out the treasures of the temple, the robes of the high priest, the two golden candelabra, and heaps of cinnamon and cassia, spices used in the sanctuary. When the rest surrendered, Titus executed them as it was fitting for priests to perish with their temple. Jerusalem was, and still is, a city of tunnels. Now the rebels disappeared underground, and it took Titus another month to conquer the rest of the city. When it fell, the Romans poured into the alleys, sword in hand. They massacred indiscriminately all whom they met, and burnt the houses with all who had taken refuge within. At night, when the killing stopped, the fire gained the mastery. Titus decided to eradicate Jerusalem, 
a decision which Josephus blamed on the rebels. The rebellion destroyed the city and the Romans destroyed the rebellion. The toppling of the temple must have been an engineering challenge. The giant ashlars of the royal portico crashed down onto the pavements below, and there they were found, nearly two thousand years later, just as they had fallen, concealed beneath centuries of debris. The spolia, the fallen stones, of Herod's temple and city are everywhere in Jerusalem, used and reused by all her conquerors and builders, from the Romans to the Arabs, from the Crusaders to the Ottomans, for over a thousand years afterwards. But the holding walls of the Temple Mount, including today's western wall, survived. No one knows how many people died in Jerusalem, and ancient historians are always reckless with numbers. Tacitus says there were 600,000 in the besieged city, while Josephus claims over a million. Whatever the true figure, it was vast, and all of these people died of starvation, were killed, or were sold into slavery. The legions entirely demolished the rest of the city and overthrew its walls. Titus left only the towers of Herod's citadel as a monument of his good fortune. There the Tenth Legion made its headquarters. This was the end which Jerusalem came to, wrote Josephus, a city otherwise of great magnificence and of mighty fame among all mankind. The temple was never rebuilt and the Jews would not rule Jerusalem again for nearly two thousand years. Yet within the ashes of this calamity lay the seeds not only of modern Judaism, but also of Jerusalem's sanctity for Christianity and Islam. The Jews, who continued to live in the countryside of Judea and Galilee, as well as in large communities across the Roman and Persian empires, mourned the loss of Jerusalem and revered the city ever after. The destruction was also decisive for Christianity. Jerusalem's small Christian community, led by Simon, Jesus' cousin, had escaped from the city before the Romans closed in. Even though there were many non-Jewish Christians living around the Roman world, these Jerusalemites had remained a Jewish sect praying at the temple. But now the temple had been destroyed, the Christians believed that the Jews had lost the favour of God. The followers of Jesus separated forever from the mother faith, claiming to be the rightful heirs to the Jewish heritage. Christians envisaged a new celestial Jerusalem, not a shattered Jewish city. In the 7th century AD, when Muhammad founded his new religion, the destruction of the temple proved for him too that God had withdrawn his blessing from Jews and bestowed it on Islam. It is ironic that the decision of Titus to destroy Jerusalem helped make the city the very template of holiness for the other two peoples of the book. From the very beginning, Jerusalem's sanctity did not just evolve, but was promoted by the decisions of a handful of men. The first of these lived a thousand years before Titus, King David.